we have not received the latter rain. Listen, in Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1, it says, ask the Lord for the rain. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. Ask the Lord for rain. Basically, we need to receive the outpouring of the latter rain. Ellen White says, the early rain came to enable the disciples to start the work, and the latter rain is going to come to enable us to finish the work. She says, the work is not going to be closed with less manifestation of power than it started. So, lo so, so let, let me explain this. Pray until. Jesus told the disciples as a command, pray until you receive the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, you shall receive power. They come together. When the Holy Spirit comes, power comes. Then Jesus says, then go. Well, this is where we start. Ellen White says in the book of Acts of the Apostles that the disciples understood that they could not do this mission in their human power. They knew they were a hand of people, no money, no media, persecuted. How could they evangelize their city, Jerusalem? Moreover, the country, moreover, the continent, moreover, the whole world. They knew they could not do it. So they prayed for the promise of the comforter. And they prayed. Acts chapter 2 says they were dedicated to prayer. They prayed, Lord, you promised the Holy Spirit. We need it. We cannot do it in our power. We humble ourselves. Please give us the promise. And the spirit of prophecy says, when the Holy Spirit came, powerful things happened. Thousands got baptized. 5,000 one day, 3,000 next day. Then the Bible says that God added daily to their numbers. That means they had the baptism Monday. They had the baptism Tuesday. They had the baptism Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Every day, sick were healed, dead were resurrected. They spoke in tongues. Powerful things happened. Why don't things, why don't those things happen today? Because we need to desperately pray for the outpouring of the latter rain. Unless we do that, we'll not be able to finish the work in our power. Pray until you receive the Holy Spirit. Then, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power. Then go and preach. Let me share now the screen with a few slides and then we continue. Listen carefully. The preaching of the word will be of no avail without the presence and aid of the Holy Spirit. This is the only effectual teacher. Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his church and that promise belongs to us as much as it belonged to the first disciples. The Sire of Ages, page 672. The members have depended too much on the pulpit instead of on the Holy Spirit. First selected message is 127. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, the disciples were to receive marvelous power. The Sire of Ages, 821. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, the disciples were so filled with love for him and for those that he died for that the hearts were melted by the words they, sp they spoke and the prayers they offered. They spoke in the power of the Holy Spirit. And under that influence, under that power, thousands were converted. The book of Acts, page 22. The gospel was to be carried to the uttermost parts of the world. And they, the disciples, claimed the power that Christ promised. Then it was that the Holy Spirit was poured out and thousands were converted a day. So it may be now, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In their days was the former rain, and glorious was the result. But the latter rain would be even more abundant. The Sour of Ages, 827. So let me say this. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, during communism in Romania, it was against the law to build a church. If they caught you, you would be arrested. You would go to prison for the rest of your life. You would be beaten, tortured. Many never came back home. It was against the law to bring Bibles in the country. It was against the law to do evangelism. It was against the law to, to build churches. You will be arrested. <clears throat> My father was a man of prayer. He prayed continually. He prayed without ceasing. Uh, when we would go to sleep, he was praying. 
in the middle of the night, if I woke up to go to the kitchen and eat a little because I was hungry, he was still praying. In the morning, he was still praying. I asked him, why do you pray so much? And he said, I pray until I'm filled with the Holy Spirit to the degree that I no longer control myself, but God controls me. I don't speak my words, but I speak the, the words that God inspires me to the degree that the Holy Spirit lives in me and I walk with him and I talk with him. And I said, dad, come on, you cannot talk to God. And my father would say to me, oh yes, God talked to Abraham. God talked to Moses, God talked to Joseph, God talked to Daniel, God talked to Paul, God talked to John, he talked to Peter. God still speaks. It's just that we never have time to listen. The Bible says, the Bible says, listen carefully. In Revelation, he who has ears to hear what the Spirit says, it's just that we never listen, we are too busy. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. Isaiah says, your ear would hear a voice behind you saying, this is the path. The Bible says in Psalm, he awakens my ear to listen. And so my father said to me, we sing the song and he walks with me and he talks with me, but we never listen. And he would say, son, if you pray for the power of the Holy Spirit, you will sense God's leading when you are filled by the Spirit. So let me, let me give you this example. My father was praying and he talked to the pastor. We had a good pastor, converted, humble, dedicated, hardworking, loving Jesus. My father talked to him and said, listen, I prayed a lot and God inspired me that we need to build a church. Our church is old, broken. We need to build a church. The pastor said, brother Goya, I pray too, and God inspired me too that we need to build a church. But if we build a church, we'll get arrested by the Communist Party, and we all go to prison for the rest of our lives. My father said, Pastor, if God gives the command, if it's not our plan, sometimes we make the plan and ask God for his blessing. We ask God to bless our plan. That's the reason we don't experience blessings. But if we seek God's plan, if God tells us what to do, then he will give us his blessing, his protection, his resources. And if God is with us, who can be? If God is with us, who can be against us? So let's not be afraid of the communist government because our God is greater. He who is with us is greater than he who is against us. Our God is greater than the government. If God wants us to go to prison, like Joseph, we go to prison. But if God wants us to be free, We'll be free. Let's build the church. Well, well, well. They talked to the board. The board was so scared. They, whoa, we go to prison. But my father talked to them and they decided to build a church. I was young. I was in fifth grade. Everybody worked. Men, women, children, elderly. Everybody worked. We met every night at 11 p.m., and we worked until 5 a.m. in the night. We didn't use any light. We worked in the dark, so nobody could see us. We didn't use any power tools, so nobody would hear us. We built quietly, so the communist government would not know. We demolished the old church and left the front wall of the old church prompted. And we built the new church behind the front wall of the old church, hiding. After three months of building every night, the new church structure was taller than the front wall of the old church. And we still didn't have a roof. That night, I remember, it was raining. We were building and the police came. Somebody called the police. They started to knock in the front gate. Open the gate. You are building a church without permit. People started to cry. Lord, they are going to arrest us. We'll be beaten and tortured. We'll go in prison. Please protect us. They went under the new structure of the new church in the back under the balcony. And they started to cry and to pray. My father went to the gate and said, what do you want? And the police said, open the gate. 
My father said, do you have a warrant? No, we don't. Then I don't open the gate. Aren't you afraid? We will terminate you. We will arrest you. No, I am not afraid. Go get a warrant. Well, it's 2 a.m. We cannot go to the judge at 2 a.m. Then you come tomorrow after you get a warrant. Oh, the police got so angry. They left. They promised to punish my father. They left. My father went in the, under the structure of the new church. And he said to the church members, stop crying. If you are afraid, you must have a very small God. Because if your God is the God of the universe, why are you afraid? Stop praying for your safety, for your freedom. He shall increase, we shall decrease. We are nothing. Pray for God's honor. Pray that this city, this communist city, would know that there is a God in heaven. Pray for the church. Don't pray for self. Forget self. God is more important than you. And they started to pray, Lord, whatever happens to our freedom, we are willing to lose everything, freedom or life. But work for your name's sake. Work that this city may know that there is a God in heaven. And they prayed and they prayed until morning. The police didn't come back. We built another two, three months. We finished the church, the pastor's house, the Sabbath school rooms, the bathrooms. We finished everything. Three months later, the police came. They had a warrant. They wanted to arrest us. My father told the pastor, go, go through the back door, go. No, 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 I'm staying here. My father said, there is no benefit for both to get arrested, you and me. I am old. I'm, getting, I'm ready to get retired. If I go to prison, that's okay. But you are young. God still has work for you. You still have a mission to do. There is no benefit for you to get arrested. I go to prison, you, you go, so you remain free, so you could continue to do the mission, to preach the gospel. So the pastor left through the back door. My father opened the gate. The police came in. Who is responsible for this construction, for this project? My father said, me, you can arrest me. They took my father to the police station. <clears throat> they said, why do you build this church? He said, well, God inspired me through his spirit that we need a church. Are you crazy? There is no God. Well, you may not have a God. I do have one. And he talked to me. Are you crazy? God doesn't talk. Oh, yeah, he talks. People just never listen. They said, you need to stop building churches. You need to stop bringing Bibles into the country. We are going to terminate you. He said, well, do whatever you want. God comes first. Jesus is coming soon. And we must make his kingdom a priority. We must finish the work. They said, we are going to take your salary. My father said, there is nothing to take. I give 90% a month to the church and I keep only 10% in the house. I don't have money. I invest them in heaven because Jesus is coming. We are going to fire you from your job. Oh, that would be wonderful because then I have time 24-7 to serve Jesus because Jesus is coming. We need to focus on mission. The police officer got Disparate. I'm going to shoot you. <clears throat> and my father said, that's good. Because if I live, I live for God. If I die one second to resurrection, I'm going to see Jesus face to face. The police officer put the pistol in my father's chest. My father said, let me open the shirt. He started to unbutton the shirt. The officer said, hey, the bullet goes through the shirt. My father said, oh, I know. Just it's a new shirt. It would be a pity to stain it with blood. Let me take it off and give it to somebody poor. And then you can shoot me. Just don't destroy the shirt. The officer shook his head, said, you are crazy. My father said, yes, because God's wisdom is foolishness for you. The officer called the chief of police. We cannot scare this man. He's going to keep building churches. What shall we do? He loves his God more than his life. He says that Jesus is coming soon and he needs to finish the work. What shall we do to stop him? The chief of police called the mayor of the city. What shall we do to stop this man? The mayor gave the order, execute him. Make him a lesson for everybody else. <clears throat> Let's teach them a lesson. The officer got the command, you need to execute him. So he apologized to my father. He said, I do have to follow my orders. I have to kill you. My father said, let me pray first. Oh, even if you pray, nobody's going to save you. My father said, I'm not praying for me. My life is not important. 
I want to pray for you. So my father put his hand around the shoulder of the police officer and said, Lord, if I die, it's a privilege. You died for me. I'm happy to die for you. But please, Lord, save this man. I want to see him in heaven. I forgive him. Please forgive him and save him. Amen. <clears throat> in that moment, the telephone started to ring. The officer took the telephone and it was the deputy of the city, the vice president, the one under the mayor. And he said, don't you touch this man because the spirit of the living God is in him. Don't you touch him. Let him go home. After the mayor gave the order for this man to be executed, the mayor got in his car. And when he left the city hall, a drunk driver in a big truck speeding hit the car of the mayor. And the mayor just died two minutes ago. The mayor was killed in a car accident. Don't you touch this man. Let him go home. My father came home. I said, did you know that God will save you? He said, son, that's not important. I don't live for myself. The Holy Spirit lives in me and I do whatever he says. And I am not interested in my life. I am interested in God. God is first, not me. He told me, son, now listen carefully. He said, son, many Adventists go to church and that's wonderful. Keep Sabbath and that's wonderful. Eat healthy and that's wonderful. Return tithe and that's wonderful. But they don't walk with God. They are not led by the Spirit. Therefore, when Jesus comes, He's going to say, I don't know you. And they will say, Lord, we've been going to church. We did evangelism. We, we kept Sabbath. We know the sanctuary, the 2300 days and night prophecy. We know the doctrines. And Jesus says, I don't know you. And the Levi says, quote, they were destitute of the spirit. To the group that Jesus says, I don't know you. She says, they were destitute of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me explain. How do you prepare? How do you prepare? How do you prepare? The disciples prayed until the Holy Spirit came. When the Holy Spirit came, revival happened. Power happened. Baptisms happened. Conversions happened. Healings happened. In short time, a hand of people, without education, without money, a hand of people. Ellen White says, turn coat, turn the world upside down. A hand of people turned the world upside down. What do we need to prepare for the second coming? Ellen White says, a revival of true godliness is the greatest and most urgent of all our other needs. To seek this should be our first work. How does it happen, revival? Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask then parents give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humility, dependence, and prayer to fulfill the conditions. A revival needs to be expected only in answer to prayer. The reception of the Holy Spirit is the great need of the church today. Let us pray that it may soon be realized. That's the letter, letter number 178 from 1907. Listen, the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit. Elena says, with the reception of the Holy Spirit, all other gifts become ours. This promise, the Holy Spirit, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in its train. If you miss power, if you miss resources, if you miss blessings, if you miss success, it's because we miss the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, all other, all, 100%, all other blessings come with the Holy Spirit. How do you prepare? Well, let me give you an example. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is coming. His kingdom is coming. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like 10 virgins. You know, in Luke chapter 25, 10 virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. But Ellen White says, there is no difference between them. They all go to church. They are all 10 are virgins. It's not five are virgins and five are the prostitute woman from Revelation. No, no, no. They are not five pure and five that have 
uh, basically left Jesus and they have uh, went after, after other doctrines and other gods. They all 10 are God's church. They are pure, they are virgins. They are dressed in white, Christ robe of righteousness. They all 10 have the lamps. Remember what the Bible says. Remember what the Bible says. It says, thy word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. In Psalm 119, they all have the Bible. Remember in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter six, the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. Proverbs says that the, the commandments are the light, the lamp. Basically the virgins, all 10 have the commandments. They all 10 wait for the second coming, for the parousia. They are Adventists. They are pure, they are dressed in Christ's righteousness, they have the word, they have the commandments, they have the doctrines, they are waiting for the second coming. They are the church, all 10. Now listen carefully, very important. What happens? They all 10 have oil in the beginning. Later when they sleep, oil ends. But in the beginning, all have the Holy Spirit. They all 10 have light in the beginning. Later, when they fall asleep, the light goes off. They all, you see, they all get baptized. They all go to church. They all sing kumbaya. They all eat broccoli and tofu. They all keep Sabbath. They all know the doctrines. Is it good? Oh, yes. But it's not enough. It's not enough to start well. You must finish well. It's not enough to go to school. You must graduate. It's not enough to go to the Olympics. You must win. It's not enough to be baptized. You need to finish the race. They all start well. But they not all finish well. You see, <clears throat> when I was 17, the pastor took us to the Black Sea camping. And uh, <clears throat> it was a big lake called Lake Tekirgyor. That lake has about 10 kilometers long and about five, six kilometers wide. When you are on the shore, you see the other end, very small. You see homes, very small because it's far. But when you get in the water and swim half an hour, one hour, and you depart from the shore because of the waves, you don't see anything, only water. And the more you swim, the more you don't see anything. <clears throat> and after two, three hours of swimming, you don't know, are you going straight? Are you going in circles? You don't know. So people drown, they die on that lake. The pastor challenged us, 27 young people, who can cross the lake? The pastor and two other parents took boats, canoes, and they got on the lake and they said, if you get tired, get in the boat. Oh, there are young people with muscles. Schwarzeneggers, big. I call my father, what can I do to finish the race, to win the crown? And my father said, son, it's not enough to start well. You must finish well. That's what counts. I said, how do you do that? And my father said, stay focused. Don't let anything else distract your attention. Stay focused. How do I stay focused? I imposed myself a rhythm. I started to sing the song, bam, ba, bam, bam, ba, bam, bam, ba, bam. and I started to swim in that rhythm. Bam, ba, bam, bam, ba, bam, bam, ba, bam. Bam, ba, bam. The others, they choo, 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 choo. <laughs> and they got tired and they stopped. I was going bam, ba, bam, bam, ba, bam, bam, ba, bam. And then I caught them from behind and I passed them. And then they saw me, oh, Pavel passed us. And they started, choo, 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 choo. <coughs> and then I was, pam, 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 pam. And one by one, they got tired and they got in the boat. I was going, pam, 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 pam. They said to me, Pavel, we all got in the boats. There is nobody to compete with. Get in the boat. I said, no, I need to finish the race. Pam, 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 pam. <clears throat> and I was swimming. They left. 
in about five hours, I got to the other shore. They were eating at the restaurant. They said, get in the boat, let's go back. No, I jumped in the lake, another five hours. Pam, 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 pam. They asked me, how did you do it? I told them, I stayed focused. Let me make a parallel with our presentation. 10 virgins, in the beginning, they all get baptized. They all start well, they all jump in the water, they all swim, they all get baptized, they all go to church, they all sing Kumbaya. But then five of them go daily back and they fill their container daily with new oil, a daily fresh baptism of the spirit, a daily relationship with Christ. They make it a priority to daily fill their container with God's presence. Five, they get distracted, they get busy. And they still have oil and they still have fire. But in time, their fire goes a little slower and a little lower and a little lower. And they all fall asleep. But when they wake up, five of them have no more oil. <clears throat> now I want to explain something. They had the lamps, all 10. The word, thy word is a lamp. They had the word. They had the oil, the Holy Spirit. But the lamp, according to archaeology, according to tradition, would last, the oil in the lamp would last about four hours. And they all had the lamps. They all had oil in the lamps. But after they woke up from the sleep, none of them had oil. But the wise had reserve, it says, they had reserve, 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 reserve oil. They put from the reserve container oil in the lamp. <clears throat> they had, according to tradition, reserve containers that would last, the oil in the reserve would last seven to eight hours, plus the oil in the lamp another three, four hours. All together, 10, 11, 12 hours, it would go through the night. They all had oil in the lamps, but five of them, daily filled the reserve container. The others didn't fill it. They all fall asleep, the wise and the foolish. What is, what is sleep? What is sleep? What is sleep? You see, sleep could be many things. Could be ignorance to the urgency of the times we live. But also sleep could be something different. It says that during the storm, Jesus was sleeping in the boat. And the disciples woke him up. Don't you care that we perish? And the spiritual prophecy says that Jesus was sleeping because he was safe in the father's hands. <clears throat> Peter was sleeping in prison. And the spiritual prophecy says that he knew that God is in control and that he is safe in God's hands. What is sleep? Can it be a false sense of safety, a false sense of security? We are Adventists. We have the doctrines, we have the truth, we are God's church, we understand the Sabbath, we understand the sanctuary, we have the health reform, we are God's people, we are the church. And that would give us, we go to church, we, 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 we have the spirit of prophecy, that gives us a false sense of security. And we fail to fill the reserve container with oil. More than that, you see, <clears throat> Why didn't Jesus choose for the Holy Spirit wind? Because he says to Nicodemus, the Holy Spirit is like the wind. Why didn't Jesus choose fire? Because over the disciples' head, fire came. Why oil? Because oil was used to anoint somebody when God called them. And it meant it was 100% set apart for service. Oil, because when the Holy Spirit comes, you fully Commit. God calls you to full 100% commitment. The Holy Spirit set you aside. And so, <clears throat> listen carefully, all fall asleep. And then all wake up. The wise and the foolish. Oh, the groom is coming. Jesus is coming. Look to the virus. Look to the wars. Jesus is coming. Let's wake up. They all wake up. But five have reserve oil and five have not. Because they failed to daily. They got distracted. They didn't swim. They got distracted. They started well. 
but they got distracted. They failed to daily fill the container with oil, to fill themselves with God's presence, with the Holy Spirit. It's better if I go, because if I go, I'm going to send you the comforter, and he will lead you in all. Anyway, <clears throat> listen carefully to this quotation. This is very important. By the sleeping disciples is represented a sleeping church when God's day of visitation is near. Christ is at the door. Men and women are in the very last hours of probation, yet they are foolish. They sleep, and the pastors have no power to wake them up because the pastors sleep too. Sleeping pastors preaching to sleeping people. Whoa. It means that I am sleeping too, everybody. Basically, sleeping to the urgency of the times we live. Jesus is finally coming. We have no more time to lose. We need to prepare today, not tomorrow. Today, we need to be filled with oil. Today, not tomorrow. We need to make God's work a priority. Today, not tomorrow. And so, <clears throat> very interesting, very interesting that, uh, listen, the Holy Spirit was pulled over the early church as early rain to help them fulfill their mission. And the Holy Spirit will be pulled over the last church to help us finish the work. Shouldn't we pray for the Holy Spirit? Uh, I want to explain. When the groom comes, five foolish have the lamps, but don't, they don't have oil. They have the lamps. What are the lamps? The lamps are the forms that contain the oil, the forms that hold the, the oil. The five, they have the forms, the exterior form, the lamp but they don't have the content, the oil inside. Listen what Ellen White says. She says, I'm going to give you the quotation right now. She says that they are satisfied with the forms of religion without the relationship. I'm going to read the, 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 the quotation for you. Listen, let's go through a few quotations. Without the spirit of God, the knowledge of the world is of no avail. The theory, the doctrines, the Bible, all of them good. Without the spirit, they cannot sanctify the heart. Pharisees knew the theories. One may be familiar with the commandments and the promises, but unless the spirit would set the truth home, the character will never be transformed. In the parable, all 10, wait, all 10 have lamps. So with the church before second coming, they all have knowledge of the scripture. Yet, yet they have no oil. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. Wow. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They believe the truth. They preach the truth. But they are content with a superficial religion. Their service to God degenerates into forms. They have the forms but they don't have the relationship. They are satisfied because they go to church, because they do this, they do that, all the forms. At the final day, many will claim admissions to the kingdom, but in this life, they have not entered into fellowship with Christ. Now listen to this paragraph. Saddest of all words will be the words, I don't know you. The fellowship of the spirit that you have neglected could alone, alone, the fellowship of the spirit that you have ignored could alone prepare you for the marriage feast. Wow. If God is to bless his church in the last days, it will be because the doctrines of the Holy Spirit will not only be studied, but sought after with the whole heart. Ministers and congregation should bow down before God with one cry. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. We have tried to be Christians without the Holy Spirit. We have not filled our churches with the Holy Spirit. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, it would be better to close the churches. If pastors don't have the Holy Spirit, they should not preach. 
I think I don't speak too strong when I say a church without the spirit is rather a curse than a blessing. Since this is the means, the Holy Spirit, by which we are to receive power, why don't we hunger? Why don't we thirst for the Spirit? Why don't we talk? Why don't we pray? Why don't we preach about the Spirit? For the daily, 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 not in the beginning when you get baptized, daily baptism of the Spirit, every worker should offer his petitions. Companies of Christians should gather together. Especially they should pray that God will baptize his workers and his church with a rich measure of the Spirit. The presence of the Spirit will give proclamation of the truth, power. If there was a time when we need the Spirit, it is now. In the great and measureless gift of the Spirit are contained all other heaven resources. It's not because of any restriction on God's part that we don't receive them. If you are willing to receive, all will be filled with the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit, if claimed by faith, will bring all other blessings in his train. Listen, my brothers and my sisters, my time is almost up, but I want to, 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 to finish with another story. You see, how do you prepare for the second coming? How do you personally grow? How your church would grow? How do we experience revival and baptisms and growth? How are we ready? This is what the five failed to understand. To be daily filled with the Holy Spirit, to make it an urgency, to make it vital, to make it crucial, to daily plead for the baptism of the latter rain. Lord, like the disciples, Elena says that in the upper room, they pleaded for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we cannot do it in our power. Is not by human power, it's by your spirit. You promise the Holy Spirit to those who ask. We pray that you fulfill that promise. We humble ourselves and ask for your spirit. This is how we prepare. And this is what our churches should do. And this is what the pastor should do. As the disciples did in the upper room. So we receive the latter rain and finish the work. <clears throat> we pray to the degree that we are filled with the Holy Spirit to the degree that the Holy Spirit moves in our hearts. The Holy Spirit moves in our homes. The Holy Spirit moves in our churches. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. Then we are going to have power. Then the Holy Spirit is going to work and influence those around us. Then thousands will be baptized. Then we will be ready. Let me give you a story as we finish. In 1977, there was a strong earthquake in Romania. <clears throat> 7.6 on Richter scale. Many thousands died. Many people perished. We lived in a taller building at the fourth level, fourth story. When the building started to move, my mom started to cry, Lord, if I die, please forgive my sins so I will be saved. My father said, honey, you don't wait for the crisis to solve your problems. You solve your problems daily. You daily fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. You daily fill yourself with God. You daily confess your sins. You daily seek God's presence. Because if you have God, you have peace. And so my father started to sing. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. My mom said, how can you sing during the earthquake? My father said, I open my mouth and it comes. I have no reason to be afraid. If God is with me, even if the building would collapse and 10,000 will die in my right, <clears throat> I will stand. And if God wants me to die, I am ready. I have God's presence. I have peace. In that moment, somebody knocked on the door. Who would knock on the door during the earthquake? My father opened the door. It was our next door neighbors, husband and wife. Mr. Goya, can we come in? Why would you want to come in? People are running down the stairs to get out of the building. Mr. Goya, the stairs are breaking. It's not safe. Why don't you go outside the building? There are so many tall buildings. They are falling on us, burying us alive. 
There is no place to run. <clears throat> and the building is collapsing. My father said, but my apartment is in the building. Why do you think it's safe in my apartment if the building would collapse? And they said, we know that heaven lives in your house. We know that God's presence lives in your house. We know that God's spirit lives in your house. We know that heaven is here. When we fight, when we scream, when we watch crazy movies, when we listen to crazy music, we hear you praying and singing. You go from door to door. You give people fruits and vegetables and you give people books and you pray for people. We know that God lives in you. We know that God lives in your house. That's the reason your house is heaven. Your house is the single safe place in the whole building. <clears throat> My father said, okay, come in. The earthquake stopped. My father had a prayer for them. And then I remember he looked them in the eyes and he said, don't you wait for the crisis to prepare. It's too late. You don't prepare the night before the Olympics for the Olympics. You don't prepare the night before the war for the war. You don't prepare the night before the final medical exam for the final exam. Don't you wait for the crisis to prepare. Fill yourself with God's presence daily. And when the crisis comes, you will be ready. Don't wait for tomorrow. This is crucial. Fill yourself with God's presence today. And when the crisis comes, you are safe. Listen, folks. This is nothing. Moreover, in the times we live, nothing that we should ignore. This is what ourselves as leaders should do. This is what our members should do. Fill yourself with the Holy Spirit today, every day. So when the crisis comes, you are safe. Fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. So your lamp, your, your, yourself is filled with oil. Because then you have peace. You have power. You have victory. The Holy Spirit in you can influence people that you work with. The Holy Spirit can convert. The Holy Spirit can change the hearts. The Holy Spirit can bring thousands. That's when you have power. That's when you have success. That's when your church is growing. Fill yourself with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what five missed and five had. And that made the difference between saved and lost. And this is what God is calling us. Moreover, in the times we live, I pray that God is going to bless your division richly with the power of the Holy Spirit and revival like never before. Let me have a prayer and then we finish. Father in heaven, the promise of the Holy Spirit is absolutely crucial for our preparation and for the preparation of the church and for finishing the work. Help us to understand the vital, crucial need for the Holy Spirit, for revival, and help us make it a priority. Father, bless SSD division. Fill them, the leaders, the pastors, the members, with your spirit. And help us all to be aware that we have no more time to procrastinate, that this is urgent. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pavel Goya. We have uh, an, uh, several questions, if you could uh, briefly answer some of them. Why can't we see the power of the Holy Spirit filling today's leaders and pastors like the apostles were? Well, <clears throat> I would not focus so much on others, but rather on self. We should not wait for the pastor for the church, the church is not the building, it's not the institution, the church is the people. We should not wait. When the church, when the pastor and the leader is, then I, I do it. God is going to make each one responsible for self. Every revival in my doctoral paper, you see facts. Every revival in the world history happened when a small group of people, one or two, I could give you practical examples. For instance, Jeremiah Lampier, the one who instituted the Bible Society in New York. It was one man who started to pray in Central Park for the Holy Spirit every day from 12 to 1. And it was 10 people and then 100 people and then 1,000. Two weeks later, the economy dropped and then tens of thousands came. And the history says 10,000 a week 
every week until there were 1.4 million people converted. One person. God can work through one as he can work through a thousand or through a million. God can work to 300 and give victory. But we should not wait for anybody. It's our duty, my duty to pray for the Holy Spirit, your duty to pray, everybody for self. You cannot say when the Holy Spirit comes for the pastor, then I'm going to pray. We, each one, will be responsible as each virgin was responsible for her oil. We, each one, have to be aware of our personal need. Even, I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but even the thought of what would others do, that thought would hinder me to receive the Holy Spirit. And so it's in my own interest to focus on the fact that I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And to our example, we can influence others. And I could give you practical examples. When I was a student in Bucharest, in the church that I went to, big church, gigantic church, uh, nothing was happening. Basically boring. It was boring. My friend and I didn't wait for the church to do it or for the leaders to do it. We got together, my friend and I, in a room, in an attic, and we prayed every day for one hour for revival for our church. After two months, another girl joined us. After two weeks, another two boys. In about another four or five months, there were 52 young people praying for revival. In about two years, the church was revived. The stories, you will not believe the stories. So basically, God is calling you, each one, to make it a priority and not wait for anybody else. There is no more time to wait. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pavel Goye. One more question and then we move on. We do believe in the power of the Holy Spirit when we preach the gospel. Is it appropriate to set a goal for baptism? <laughs> That's a big question. Uh, and uh, the answer has to be long. I cannot give a short answer and explain it properly. But you see, we, uh, we see two perspectives. One says, work in faith without giving numbers. The other one says, hey, have a goal and have, have faith. Because if you don't have a vision, people without vision perish. If you don't have a vision, if you don't have a desire, you'll never get there. If you don't know where you go, you don't go anywhere. So we should have big goals, pray for them in faith and move in faith, but not make it basically the rule of faith like oh if you don't baptize 300 you are not a faithful person uh, jesus uh, didn't baptize anybody but because of his work the disciples baptized thousands so basically we should have big goals and work hard and pray hard but not necessarily make the numbers more important than the commitment and the work I, this is a lot to explain. I don't have time to go deep. I do have it in a presentation where I give both parts and then I explain what is my vision about it. However, we don't have time right now unless we go another 15 minutes, the list, to go through that. However, I recommend my personal recommendation. I recommend that we pray about it and then we have big vision because we have a big God. Small vision means, small faith means small God. Big vision is when you pray a lot and you work hard and you expect. Ellen White says, expect an answer to your prayer in faith. Pray big and expect an answer. Many times we pray and we doubt that an answer will come. Expect an answer. And so let's suppose I have a vision for 300 and I work hard and I pray hard. And I have faith. And I baptize only 150. My brother, my sister is better than nothing. I am happy that I baptized 150, though I didn't baptize 300. It's worse when we don't have a goal. And therefore, we are not motivated. Now, I don't agree with some ideas that, oh, if you don't baptize 300, you should be fired or anything. But in the same time, I don't believe that people who don't work are committed. People who love Jesus. They make work and mission a priority above their own life. I'm going to end there because it's a lot to say. This is, it depends how you put it. It, it needs a lot of explanation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, one question um, that uh, has been raised about uh, the story you told about your father building the church. 
people are asking in what country was it in romania in romania during communism let me add a little to the previous question i don't have time but in my doctoral paper i give a practical example i have three examples that happened in my ministry by god's grace alone practical example where we prayed a lot and the baptismal number went tremendously higher than average from zero growth in the last 72 years to 18.6 percent growth and so but we prayed a lot we worked hard we did bible studies evangelism a lot it's a whole presentation we don't have time to give you now it takes four hours but god gave tremendous results from zero baptisms to an average of 50 a year until the church went from 90 to 340. So it is possible, but with a lot of prayer and a lot of work. Anyway, uh, it, we don't have time for that, but God, may God bless this division tremendously. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Paul Goy. Thank you very much. My um, Elder Mandalang, should we move on? Yes, Elder Stille. Thank you, Pastor Pavel Goya, for the presentations. My privilege. If I hopefully uh, they take what is good, what they what is appropriate for their needs. God bless.